Hello and welcome to Undercommon Taste. This is a podcast where we create and discuss homebrew content for tabletop RPGs. Today we remind you, Stephen King said, books are a uniquely portable form of magic. I'm Ian Woodworth and I'm joined by my co-host James Daly. Today we have another special guest on, C.R. Rowanson, the magic engineer. He has just started the Indiegogo for his new book, The Magic System Blueprint, and so we've asked him on to talk a little bit about that. So, Clark, welcome to Undercommon Taste. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, I'm excited to, have to talk you to you guys about it. Yeah, thanks for joining us. We also like having you here because you have written our one five-star review on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> there is no nepotism at all no in this case is it just favoritism i think anyway perhaps uh i guess in order for it to be nepotism we have to give you something or check ancestry.com cronyism oh, yeah. that's it cronyism that's the there yes. we are <laughs> hooray pedantics so well, i uh, mean we are talking about books and systems so yeah <laughs> it's very easy to tell it's the end of a long day for all of us <laughs> Oh, I'm like this normally. Yeah. Well, fair enough then. So Clark, let's go ahead and get started with how about you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So as Ian said, I'm C.R. Ronson. I am an award-winning fiction author. I'm also a freelance developmental editor and writing coach for my day job. I was a chemical engineer, and now I'm actually doing project management, lots of experience teaching, lots of experience with analysis, and I've been obsessed with magic systems pretty much my whole life. I didn't realize that that was an obsession until I really got into writing. I was like, oh, I'm a little psycho about this. So now I help people craft and repair marvelous magic systems for their stories, and I focus heavily on the process of magic building. That's awesome. And I just want to throw out in there, you're never going to find a chemistry-focused person that's not at least a little bit into magic. It's just something that can feel. I mean, let's be honest. We all do chemistry because that's as close as we're going to get to alchemy. This is true. So... What was it that actually got you into developing and analyzing magic systems? Yeah, so that is an outstanding question. I'll give you the short version, and then we can go into the long version if you want. But like I said, I have loved magic systems my whole life. Like, if there's magic in games or books or movies, I'm far more likely to pick it up and go through with it. But I was in college going through my engineering degree, and a friend sent me copies of the Mistborn trilogy by Brandon Sanderson. And as I was reading through it, that's when I kind of had this aha moment of people like this kind of magic system. And this is how I think about magic. So people might like the magic systems I work with. I said I was going to do the short version, and it's very quickly turning into the long version. So, oh, well. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, <laughs> we've got an hour. Yeah. So I actually just started digging into it. And started building out this elaborate magic system with all of these intricacies, pulling in as much science as I possibly could, talking to my friends about it to the point where they just said, okay, Clark, shut up. Like, you've talked about this enough. We don't want to talk about your magic system anymore. Write it down and we'll read it. And I wrote it down and they didn't read it because it was essentially a textbook on my magic systems. <laughs> So then me thinking that I was being super clever was like, fine, I'll put it in a story and then you'll want this as extra material. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, <laughs> and that's how I got into writing fiction was through the magic systems. And once I was there learning about story structure and character development, all that kind of stuff, I couldn't find anything on magic systems. Like really all there was, was Sanderson's three laws, which are just three essays. And then there was a sort of helpful page on science fiction writers of America. And that was pretty much it. So I just kept doing my thing. And then as I was helping other people with their stories, I just slowly started to realize I've got a lot of this knowledge built in here. And that's just kind of how I kept taking steps forward because I love helping people. And at the end of the day, I want to see better magic systems everywhere. I really don't care if they're mine. And that's kind of how I got where I am. Yeah, because I am also involved in the publishing business. I'm an acquisitions editor for an independent publisher. So you do the job before I get it. And so I always appreciate someone like you <laughs> who's actually going through and getting it ready for me. Because I can't tell you how many queries I've gotten where it's like, you just sent me a rough draft of what you just wrote. 
it is obvious you haven't gone through and touched this with a red pen yet. Yeah, you can't do that. And that's part of why I like the developmental editing process is that really digs into the broad strokes of the story and theme and tone and the magic and leaves the technical gritty grammar stuff to people like you so that I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, the technical gritty grammar stuff happens after me in copy edits. What I do is called line edits, which is making sure that everything is in the right order sequentially, making sure that there's no inconsistencies. Like you're saying that he's taking a wide stance with his sword here, but two paragraphs later, he's still on his horse. Right, right. Okay, so you're the intermediary stage. Yeah, I'm I'm that intermediary. I'm, I'm the one that gets it as good as we can get it. And then we send it to copy edits and then they take care of making sure that it's all in Chicago and ready for publishing. Gotcha. But yeah, that's where it all came from is I like helping people. I love magic systems. There weren't any resources. So I thought, you know, what the hell? I guess I'm going to start making some resources. And that was about five years ago that I really got serious about doing that on the blog. And I've been working with other authors for almost a decade now. And yeah, it's great. So when you started to sit down and write, you said you started writing your first fiction novels as a way to explain your magic system. Were you writing that as part of the story or was there just going to be like a giant appendix in the back? I was prepared to have it just be a encyclopedia of the magic of the world. <laughs> uh, I, I was all prepped. I wasn't even done with all of it, but you know, I quickly realized there's no way that all of this stuff is going to fit into a single story, which is great news for me because that means I can write so many stories and just barely touch the tip of the iceberg. And that's really where I started figuring out the process of weaving your magic into your story rather than just crafting the magic and that's probably what the first five or so years of me being serious about my writing was really all about was taking a lot of this knowledge and understanding i had about magic systems and figuring out how to meld it with the other stuff into something that truly supported each other gotcha now what i really like about your system and i'm going to ask you to follow up with this here in a second but i mean you sit there and you talk about your different types of magic systems and i mean you broke it down really simply to where there's like four main types. And it kind of reminds me of like the Myers-Briggs, of personality thing. So before it was Myers-Briggs where there was 16, you had your Jungian archetypes where it was, you know, introvert, extrovert, rational, and intuitive. And so everybody kind of got broken to those four archetypes. And you've kind of done the same with all magic systems, which I think is great because again, magic systems can get kind of unwieldy. As you said, you could sit there and spend a lifetime trying to explain how magic works in any given system but you've made things very portable and accessible with this and would you like to discuss that a little bit more and how that works absolutely i mean let's be honest here i'm the magic engineer and to be clear you're asking me to talk about magic so i have no problem with this (laughs) (laughs) yeah so there is kind of a two by two grid just a quadrant chart and that came about again from learning and studying things, starting with Brandon Sanderson, because he really kind of introduced the initial concepts. So in the types of magic chart that I use, there's the two axes. One of them is what most people are familiar with, which is the hard and soft axis. And then the other one is the rational, irrational axis. Now, those came about because, again, reading Sanderson's article on his first law of magic, he talks about what he termed hard and soft magic systems. And in there, he talks about how the author's ability to solve problems with their magic is directly proportional to the reader's understanding of said magic. And that's how he broke down hard and soft. The problem I had there is that put his Mistborn trilogy on the same side of the spectrum as Superman and Spider-Man. And that didn't feel right (laughs) because just the core functions of how those work and how those feel are so different, I didn't understand why they were so close to each other. And that's when digging in and looking around on the internet and actually grabbing some inspiration from some stuff I saw on Mythcreants, they've got some really good stuff. That's sort of where things started to click into place, that there was the second access, that they are distinct, but they are very deeply interconnected. So with that, when you put those across each other, you end up with the four quadrants of hard rational magic, 
hard irrational magic, soft irrational magic, and soft rational magic. So in short, well, I say that, but I'm already pretty long-winded. Hard and soft, in my version of the types of magics, is all about the percentage of the system that is known or understood. So the more of the total system you know, the harder it is. The less you know, the softer it is. And rational and irrational is all about your ability to take the information that you have and apply logic and correctly extrapolate from the pieces you've seen. So in my book, I finally came up with a metaphor that I actually find quite helpful. It's if you were placed in front of a table that had two buttons on it, one red, one blue, each of them produces a magical effect. You push one button and fire bursts out of the ground in front of you you now know 50% of the magic system. So you are now right in the middle between hard and soft. If you hit the other button, no matter what the magical effect is, you now understand the entire magic system, and it's a 100% hard magic system. The rational irrational comes into how it all works. So if the fire behaves like normal fire, you can use it to light a cigar, heat your water. The more assumptions that you can put in that apply the more rational it becomes. So my stove, my kitchen range is absolutely a rational magic system, a hard rational magic system. Uh, yes and no. Okay. Um, it is definitely rational. And part of that is because rational or irrational is because we make assumptions based on our understanding and experience of reality around us. So that's really where it breaks down is rational systems adhere closer to what we expect of reality. So your stove is kind of the basis that we would hold this jet of flame to. So the more that this jet of flame can behave like your stove, the more rational it is. From our perspective, your stove isn't magic because it's not an object beyond our comprehension or understanding. Gotcha. I was kind of leaning into the uh, similarity because, I mean, I did get to watch some of your videos. And you touched on one of my absolute favorite things with Arthur C. Clarke, that technology can actually be considered magic. And then I think you said it was, was it Bridget's Law or Agatha's Law? Agatha's Law, yeah. Yes. I'll let you, if you want to talk, touch on that as well. Yeah. So, oh man, this is great. I just get to keep talk, talk, talking about magic. So again, this came from something that was already kind of established, and it started with Clark's third law, which that's Arthur C. Clark. He came up with like three sort of tenets or philosophies he developed about writing science fiction. And the third one is the most popular one, that is, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's kind of become a staple in a lot of the genres. And there is a webcomic called Girl Genius, where as I was binge reading it when I should have been doing other things, one of the side adventures, the main character Agatha, ends up saying any sufficiently analyzed magic is indistinguishable from technology. And that really clicked it into place. Another thing that I had been struggling with for a while is that is why they are the same. They are two sides of the same coin is it's just how much you know or understand and how you present it that differentiates between magic and advanced tech. That sounds great. Yeah. All right. So we've invited you on to talk about your new project, which is the magic system blueprint. So can you explain to us a little bit what the magic system blueprint is and how all of what we've just been talking about has been incorporated into it. Yes, I would be happy to do so. <laughs> uh, so the magic system blueprint at its core is a single page worksheet. It's a single page template that I have developed and refined over actually it's about a decade now of all of my work and knowledge about magic systems is comprised in this single worksheet. And it is there to help you quickly come to a high level understanding of your system as a whole and how it fits into the world and how it can fit into your story. And what that really came down to was trying to strip away a lot of the flavor and as weird as it sounds, the distinguishing features of all of the magic systems so that I could identify the underlying core mechanics and core cogs that all magic systems have. And that's where the types of magic was a major part of that is understanding how it is perceived and how it works within the perception of the person viewing it. The others are what I call the magic system variables. And these are distinct properties that tell you important information about your magic system. So for example, and these are all related to common questions that we often asked. I'm just trying to refine them and clarify them a bit more to make it a little easier to process and make decisions. One of them right at the top is prevalence. 
And prevalence is all about, surprise, surprise, how prevalent your magic is in the world around it. And depending on the perspective you take, that can shift the meaning there. But in general, it's a sliding scale from low to high. The more common and the more frequently the magic is encountered in the world, the higher the prevalence. The less common, the lower the prevalence. And depending on where you set it, there's all kinds of implications about how that's going to shape your world, how your world has grown around it, what you can do with the story, how your characters are going to interact with it, how your readers are going to see it, and on and on and on. And I should take a breath. Uh, (laughs) So I identified a number of these variables. I initially started with 10, and as I've been playing with them, I narrowed it down to eight and most of them are sliding scales a couple of them are knobs that you turn between distinct settings so what the blueprint is is it's kind of like a soundboard where you move these knobs and these sliders and depending on where you set it that's how you get the high level understanding of your magic system but my magic goes to 11. (laughs) oh man you just gotta break the scale don't you (laughs) he's good at that i really am it's a feature not a bug (laughs) <laughs> it's fine. We'll just make 10 the same volume, like just 10, but it'll be louder. So it'll be the same <laughs> as your 11. Uh, <laughs> I love that movie. That's such a horribly bad, but good movie. <laughs> I need to watch it again. But yeah, that's how I structured the blueprint was identifying these core pieces, which real quick, they are transference. So the transference of power, how easy it is to move it between magic users and how easy it is to gain it. Prevalence source which is you know where the magic comes from and whether it's an infinite finite or renewable source flux which has to do with whether the magic is increasing or decreasing naturalness which relates to how well it meshes and blends with the setting around it if it's high naturalness it seems like a natural part of the setting in the world if it's low naturalness it's going to seem aberrational and a little outside what you would expect it's going to stand out then ease of use reliability and consistency. So real quick, reliability has to do with the reliability of the magic itself in terms of mostly consistency of effect as well as consistency of magnitude. And I go into the nuances of that more in the book. And then consistency has to do with, if you were looking at data, it's the error bars on all your other settings. So if your magic is extremely consistent, and you set naturalness to high, that means every piece of your magic system is going to have high naturalness. If consistency is really low and you set it to high, that means at least some of it is going to have high naturalness, but other parts of it could vary greatly. That makes a lot of sense. And I think having a tool like this, like if I was going to sit down and write a short story or a novel, I think that's actually a really good idea to have something like this because you can set yourself some boundaries So it's easier not to run off the rails because, I mean, if I write anything or if I just think, my mind tends to run off the rails because that's, again, what I do. So I think kind of having some guidelines like this is actually an amazing tool for writers. And from anyone from like a hobbyist, I think something like this could even be like introduced in a school setting because, again, a young writer's kind of try to break bad habits before they form type thing. But yeah, like I said, I think this is a really solid concept to have. I'm really hoping so. I think there's a lot of potential use for it because... I've even actually done a little bit of consulting with some screenwriters, and I learned a bit about how they pitch shows. And one of the things I thought would be really cool, getting ahead of myself. Okay, so two of the other aspects that aren't about how the magic functions, but are important pieces of the blueprint, are the seed crystal and the perspective. Perspective is another thing that when I figured it out was kind of like, duh, I don't know how we never saw this. Because... Anytime you say one of these things like, well, it's easy to use or it has high prevalence, common questions people will ask are going to be, well, is that you or the reader? What about the main characters? And that's what the perspective is. You choose the point of view that you are examining your magic system from. Because how I see the magic system is going to be different from how my reader sees it, which is going to be different from how a character sees it. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. And the more I work with it, the more awesome I find that. It's also incredibly helpful, I think, as an analysis tool, because when I was building this up, I was mapping them out, working through all of the definitions of this. And as I got to the final iteration, I mapped out a couple of well-known systems. They're in the book. I have specifically Allomancy from the Mistborn series and also Lord of the Rings, the magic from the movies. And I filled these out and I showed them to a friend of mine who is primarily a Christian fiction and sweet romance writer who has not read or seen either of the series, 
took one look at each of the blueprints and said, could these systems be any more different? And I was so happy because somebody who has not read the books, has not watched the movies, took 10 seconds and was able to see how the systems were different and have an idea of how they were going to work in the story. That's awesome. As you can tell, I'm pretty excited and pleased with how it's all coming together. (laughs) Yeah, like I said, from everything I've seen and the way you're discussing this, you've made what would seem like a very esoteric or a very nebulous topic extremely accessible. And I don't do a whole lot of creative writing personally. That's just not where my brain normally goes. But even those moments I do, again, having something so tangible to say, this is what I'm doing or laying out so anybody can kind of see what they're doing. And and it sounds like it's such a great tool to have to just really improve your writing so very much. And I'm really glad to hear that because that is my goal with all of this. Another quick anecdote. So my wife and I both actually cook a lot, but our approaches are drastically different. She will go into the kitchen and she has stuff on the stove. She's cutting stuff up. She's not even measuring stuff out. She's throwing things in the pot. People are screaming. Fires are burning. But then she comes out and there's all the clanking noises and she just comes out with good food. And if I ask her how she did it, she will just tell me that she followed the ancestors. (laughs) (laughs) every time and if i ask her what's in it she will tell me it's poison so (laughs) (laughs) this makes the chemist in you scream doesn't it oh oh you have no idea Uh, because i don't work that way i have to start with cookbooks and recipes and build from there and i know i'm not the only person like this so that really is my goal to take these things that so far have been primarily practiced instinct and intuition and trying to make it something more tangible that we can actually study and improve rapidly. Yeah. So just a quick disclaimer, I was one of the beta readers for this book. And thank you again for that. You helped make it much better. (laughs) Well, thank you. But I have had the opportunity to read this book from cover to cover. And I have to say that it is a very useful tool. And one of the things that I was afraid of whenever you were first pitching it was that this was going to read like a dusty, stodgy college textbook. (laughs) And so and when I got into it, you did a very good job, I think, of keeping it. It's a very conversational tone to the whole thing. And so it's an easy read, but it conveys all all of the necessary information in a way that's easy to digest. And so I just, I have to plug it a little bit because it is actually not only useful, but it's also usable. Well, I can promise you that the first draft would not have been usable to to anybody (laughs) but me. (laughs) Well, and first drafts really are. Let's, let's just be honest. Yeah, your first draft is the worst your story is ever going to be, which means it's painful to get it on the page, but then it's only better from there. I think it was Neil Gaiman that said your first draft is you telling yourself the story. Huh. It was either Neil Gaiman or Terry Pratchett. I like that. I just know that first drafts, whether it's blog posts, nonfiction, fiction, is excruciating for me. But that's just what I hold on to is the first draft is the worst it's ever going to be. It's only getting better from here. (laughs) Yes. So, and again, this sounds like an amazing tool and I can see tons of different uses for it. So here at Under Common Taste, we are largely a homebrew world build type podcast. It's what we do. So taking this tool, how would you use this tool if I was trying to homebrew a game session or a magic session for my things? How would you try to use this tool for that? Because, I mean, I could easily see this being used in trying to build a magic system for a world or trying to fine tune or anything like that. Yeah. So there's so many ways that you can use it. And I now understand why so many creators, when they're talking about this stuff, they're just gushing and gushing about it because I get it now. Because just as I worked on it, I started seeing more and more. Honestly, of the entire blueprint, probably the most powerful thing of the entire book is just that one little box in the top right that is perspective. Because once you understand how to use that, the blueprint goes from just being cool to being a mind-blowing game changer that I now use for literally everything. Because if you think of your magic as a thing, an actual tangible thing, like maybe a statue or a living creature, what have you, it's a real thing with dimensions. The blueprint is us taking a picture and quantifying what we see. And the perspective is the angle and positioning from which we take that picture. And that means that has multiple implications with it. The big one being that to get a full three-dimensional scan of your system, you want to take multiple snapshots. The other aspect of that means if you want to understand somebody's experience, you just need to fill it out from their perspective. So 
I have used this in my current game when I have been actually developing, not full cultures, because full cultures are something I'm a little weak with, but just sort of attitudes from different parts of the world. So I will pick a perspective. So for example, and just quick stealth plug for a system, I love playing the Open Legend system, which is all open source and it's fantastic. Anyway, my players are in the capital of Amaranth, where it is just wild with bio augmentations. And that's where they came from. That's their home. They then started traveling out. I started doing blueprint snapshots for the different towns so that I could understand how the NPCs might perceive and react to some of the stuff that the PCs do. That is an amazing idea. And that's one way that I've used it, because if I go out way out to the outback and prevalence is super low, as soon as they do something magical, everybody's going to be a little nervous. And I found it really useful for doing that. Creating different flavors or aspects of the magic is also really useful. So if I wanted to shift from some of the more physical evocation type stuff and started looking at more of the prescience type stuff, I can then do a blueprint focusing on that portion of the magic system so that I can get a feel for how aware people are of it, how they might be using it, and stuff like that. So those are some of the ways I'd use it in a campaign setting, because most of the time you're dealing with a magic system that is given to you and you're mostly constructing the world. No, that's great. And that concept of looking from another person's perspective is such, I mean, that's something you should do as often as you can, even in everyday life. And that's one of those hard skills that's really difficult to learn to do. So, I mean, that's amazing. It'll just make you better as a person all around, and you get to do it while playing with magic systems. So, bonus! <laughs> I have to agree that the addition of the perspective to the whole blueprint sheet really was a game changer whenever I was going through it and reading through it and figuring out how to put a system together in it. Because I do have some personal projects, some creative writing projects, and some game writing projects, and being able to sit down with that sheet and just sort of graph it out did give me a much more tangible, much more useful view of what my system would look like. And that was the direction I was going to go next. If the setting was already established and you actually had freedom to create your own magic or you wanted to create magic using an existing system, you could use the blueprint to get a feel for how that is going to shape your magic. So if you're wanting to do something that is grim, dark, high tech, that's going to affect your naturalness, your ease of use, your consistency. It's going to affect all of your variables. And then by starting at the world, building out the blueprint in terms of what kind of magic could fit in there, you now have a really solid starting point in terms of actually building out your magical effects and knowing how many limitations you need, how severe those limitations can be. And it's a similar thing with your game system. Your game system is going to dictate some of this. Like if it's really number crunchy, you're probably not going to be going with a system that has really high ease of use. Because if it's not easy for the players, it's going to be hard to suspend disbelief and imagine that it's easy for the characters. At the same time, if you have one that's really open-ended and the types of effects are undefined, like Mage the Awakening, there you're going to have a hard time doing a hard rational magic system because of the nature of the rule set. And if you aren't aware of that going in, you might build a system that is incompatible with the world or game system that you want to play in. So again, kind of keeping with this topic of this perspective system, which again, I think is phenomenal. I think one of the better stories or series or versions where perspective is really important. Are you uh, by chance familiar with the Dresden Files? Oh, yes. Yeah. And so I love how Again, talking about this prevalence of magic, it really does depend on the person's perspective because there are some people that are completely clueless that magics abound. Some yes. people very much know. And then even given the types of magic being used because there are different forms of magic throughout the series that people relate to those differently even. So I could really see that tool kind of being plugged in and used in a system like that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love the Dresden Files, which by the way is a great example of a soft magic system that is right on the border between rational and irrational. I don't know. Dresden Files is a super fascinating case study for me because he works to make it so that everything seems to make logical sense and has magical equations and everything. But then there are a couple of throwaway lines that he puts out there that make me believe that that is just how magic works for Harry Dresden, because that's how he was taught. And that 
other people may have completely different views and ways of analyzing and understanding magic, which I find endlessly fascinating. That was awesome. That actually leads into a question I was going to save for later, but you bring stuff up like that now. So I was going through with your magic systems, and could you have a story with a magic system where the magic system works, but the person thinks it works one way, they might think it's a hard rational system and they have to go through formula and all this stuff to make their magic works, but it really works a completely different way. It's just working for them in that regard because of whatever, how the magic system actually works underneath. Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, and, that's, a, that's a case of perspective. And it also relates to how you build your magic system. There's so much. I get so into the weeds and love all of the detail about building magic systems. So the magic system blueprint, I'm hoping, is really just going to be kind of the intro to what I'm hoping to be a larger series that goes into a deeper dive for all the different variables and talks more about actually building your magic system because the magic system blueprint is actually just mapping it at a high level. Getting in and actually building out the specific magical effects and all of that is the next level down, but I'm digressing. My point is <laughs> one of the things that relates to the hard and soft access is knowledge and more specifically the type of knowledge. And some of the stuff you can do that there was a lot of this in the original version. And then I pulled out a lot of the talk about exceptions and quirks because I wanted it to be friendly to somebody who was just starting. But false knowledge is a big one, right? You can build it so that it, from a certain perspective, looks like an incredibly hard, rational magic system. But that entire perspective is based on a couple of false assumptions, which means the underlying magic system can be something completely different. I love that. I absolutely love that. All right. So you do happen to already have another book available on Amazon called Restrictions May Apply, where you talk about putting restrictions and limitations into your magic systems. Yes. So why do you feel that limitations and restrictions are important in a magic system? Okay. Well... So the nice version is that overpowered characters are often boring. That is really what it comes down to for me. Because if there's no limitations, that means there's no bounds on the power. And if there's no bounds on the power, then there's not really going to be any challenge. And if there's no challenge, you don't really have conflict and you don't really have an interesting story. We're looking at you, Marvel Silver Surfer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's part of my problem with Superman. That's why I could never get into Superman. I had some friends who were really into DC, and I tried. But as soon as I found the bit of lore that said he is as strong as he needs to be, I was bored. I couldn't get into it. That's really where it all starts. And not only that, limitations are fascinating, and they challenge you. So what is it? Necessity is the mother of all invention, right? If you put somebody in a corner and say, you can do these two magical effects that are limited in this way, and you have to find a way out of this box, that can be very entertaining and engaging for a specific type of person. I know that's not for everybody. That's something that I just eat up. So I like that kind of stuff. But they're incredibly useful for narrowing in on both the scope of the magic itself, but limitations can also do a lot in terms of thematic tones and how it connects to your story. Because it's not just your main characters you need to worry about. If there's no limits on the magic, then that means there's no limits for anybody, meaning absolutely anything is possible, and it's hard to wrap your head around that. Building in some of these limitations just provides more structure for you to understand and grow off of. Yeah, I like that. I mean, and if you can cast magic missile or fireball or whatever, you know, your magic is, and you can just snap your fingers and solve any problem. I mean, how do you even have a story? Once upon a time, there was a wizard, the end. Right. <laughs> and one thing that I always like to point out is that your limitations need to be meaningful. It can't just be this arbitrary thing. Just like whenever you're creating a character, the character's flaws should be meaningful. They should actually have a tangible impact on the story. And it's not just like, oh, he's missing his pinky on his right, right. hand. Okay. And how does that affect him? You know, it has to actually be something that provides a tangible barrier at some point and an obstacle that you have to work around because it's that workaround that's interesting, the interesting yeah. part. And if we're looking at things from a game perspective, magic without limits is really freaking boring. I think that's called God mode. <laughs> there might be one person who is enjoying themselves. 
who is going around solving all problems. We're like, okay, here's the boss monster. And they're like, all right, well, I'm going to kill him doing this thing that the rules don't prevent me from doing. And right. now the rest of the party gets to do nothing. And that person might be having a great time. I would get bored with that. But that's what the rules are there for. Like The rules in a game system are really all about setting the limitations so that the players can use the magic and understand what types of problems they can and can't solve with the magic. Exactly. And that's something that Ian and I have talked about many times, talking about, you know, when world creating or character creating is that need for game balance. Because yes. if you have a broken character or an Emba character, it really ruins it for the entire game. And when you find those loopholes or those places where those quirks and those limitations line up, it is extremely satisfying. Like in a campaign I'm playing in, we ended up bursting out on a bunch of cultists who were doing some big bad ritual. We honestly don't know what it was, but things were not going well. We ended up defeating everybody, but the ritual seemed to be kind of on auto cast. And our sorcerer walked forward and our DM described how it was a rune that was made out of blood. And he's like, okay, it's blood, right? And it's not magical blood or anything. Pressed a digitation and just broke the rune using a cantrip. Well done. Wow. <laughs> and we were all just losing our minds, laughing and <laughs> cheering because we dealt with the big climax with a cantrip. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's one of those one of those instances of it can't be that simple, can it? Right. And if there weren't so many limitations on cantrips and on how the magic worked and all of that, that would have just been an expected outcome rather than just a moment of sheer brilliance. It's like a here's a puzzle that I saw someone writing about on one of the D&D groups that I'm in. I'm talking about playing it off of how everybody and their mother has dark vision in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. And so the puzzle, I forget the wording of it, but there's this room that's full of identical keys. And all of the keys are gray except for one that's bright red. But it's dim light in the room. And dark vision you see in grayscale. And the way that the riddle worked, you had to have natural light with you so that you could see the red key because the red key was the one that opened the door. Nice. That's actually nice. a really good puzzle. I like that a lot. So going through it again, I've got to watch some of your videos you posted and we're definitely going to have a link to your YouTube page, I'm sure, with our description and we'll let you talk that up here in a bit. And watching your things, I know you've talked about some books and some lore and things you enjoy. You've also talked about, you mentioned some video games in those. So in the video games you've played, what is your favorite magic system as far as video game or, or computer type gaming? Whoa, big question. Huh, that is really hard to answer. <laughs> Jeez, James, I mean, you broke him. I know. Just deer in, deer in the headlights, <laughs> I think I'm just going to have to go with Skyrim, but that okay. may just be because it's my default favorite game. I think that one's a little different, and even more than just vanilla Skyrim, there's some mod overhauls that change the perk structures, and those are my favorites. And the reason for those is because then I have this structure that I can use to really help me actually build my character and their capabilities. And I really like that in games. So that is an actually important thing for me. With video games, I have to have a sense of progression. Yes. If I end the game with the same powers I started the game with, I'm probably not going to make it to the end of the game. That makes a lot of sense. Granted, even if you give me a sense of progression, I may not make it to the end of the game because I am just notoriously bad at like replaying the first six hours over and over and over <laughs> and over and over. I understand that completely as someone who still has yet to actually start into any of the DLC that I own for Skyrim <laughs> or finish the main campaign storyline. Yeah, I need to finish Skyrim too. That I mean, there's just so much to cover in Skyrim and I get lost and then I get distracted by something and then like six months later, I'm like, I forget what my character was supposed to do and kind of have to, to rinse and repeat and start all over again. Yeah, yeah. And this is talking with, you know, I have multiple character files where I have 80 plus hours. Oh, yeah. And I only just recently actually played a game where I did the Thalmor Embassy mission. And that was the furthest oh, wow. I've ever gotten in the main storyline. Oh, wow. Oh, there's so, so much more to do. Oh, I know. <laughs> Another there side is. tangent. I have been playing Skyrim VR. Oh, my. And by itself, it's not great. But again, with mods, all things are possible. <laughs> Some of the mods just take it to a whole new level. One of them is called Mage VR that lets you map spells 
to glyphs that you can draw in the air to cast them or equip them. Oh, that's fun. Oh my god, that sounds amazing. And that alone makes the experience like so amazing. But yeah, in games, I know core things for me are growth. I need to have some kind of sense of progression. And I really like it when there are varied paths that can connect and play off of one another. I really enjoy that. Not to a min-maxi level, but I really like being able to build the Assassin Rogue or the Alteration Spell Sword who bends the world around them. I like being able to do that kind of stuff. Absolutely, yeah. That's a big thing for gaming for me, too. That's honestly why Borderlands was the first first person shooter game that i actually ever beat was because i wanted to get some of the high level skills and i wanted to get them maxed out and the only way i could do that was to keep progressing because that's where i was going to find the harder bosses and get the most experience <laughs> right <laughs> all right so you and us we're all friends with the guys over at world build with us and so i let them know that you were coming on and i asked them if any of them had any questions for you and chris was the only one that chimed in and so Chris's question is, when you add magic to tech, it seems to escalate rapidly. In your opinion, should that be embraced or stopped? Don't say depends. Oh, yeah, Chris. <laughs> it's, like, it's like he's met you before. Yeah, it's like, it's like they've talked to me about magic systems before. Um, well, since I can't give you the truthful answer, um, <laughs> I would say that... In general, I would encourage people to play it closer to the vest. There's already a tendency to do power scaling in any kind of fantastical elements. So if you're not sure which direction to go, I recommend that somebody start by leaning away from that impulse and see what they can do. And then once they really understand what they need and how far they can take it, then go ahead and lean into it. But I would say lean against it. That is probably going to serve most people better when they are starting with their stories. Okay. That's some advice. I mean, again, power creep is definitely an issue in a lot of different venues. So yeah, I kind of agree. If you can kind of nip power creep early on, that definitely gives you more room to kind of work with things later. So yeah, that's definitely some sound advice. Going through just kind of like some personal fluff type questions. So in the D&D tabletop setting, because again, when it comes down to it, we do D&D &D or tabletop gaming stuff. What type or school of magic are you most drawn to? I am always torn between transmutation and illusion, honestly. I can uh, respect that. Yeah, definitely. I honestly really like playing a utility mage. In the game I'm in right now, we are heavy on the magic users. Two of us are clerics, and I just leaned heavily into the utility cleric. Our big tanky cleric was called Boom, and he makes things go boom. And I'm the one with the Book of Rituals who's identifying objects, doing Liam and Tiny Hut, and tries to have things prepped for any situation. Very nice. As a fellow cleric, I can approve. <laughs> Clerics are definitely useful, I agree. I mean, it's interesting that you picked transmutation and illusion because by and large, they do just about the same thing. It's just whether the end product is tangible or not. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you made the reference about alchemy earlier. So I guess that kind of still runs along those lines of creating what you need out of various elements. So yeah, I can totally follow that. And don't get me wrong, evocation and necromancy are super interesting, <laughs> <laughs> but they don't tend to have as much flexibility. Yeah. The one wizard that I ever actually rolled up and played is a Warforged transmuter. Oh, nice. So and I've, I've had a lot of fun with him. But yeah, that was a cool thing. I love the little class features that you get and some of the story things that you can do with it. So yeah. the very first session... The transmuter stone is super cool. Yeah, but the very first session, we were walking in, we're, you know, second level characters. And I walk into the bar and I get a seat over in the corner but I just stand next to the chair with one hand on the chair for like 10 minutes. And they're like, what in the world is he doing? And I was using my transmuter ability and I was transmuting the chair from wood to iron so I could sit on it without breaking it. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So just little things like that. I love taking the features and using them for RP aspects. Absolutely. Yeah. That's always really important in any game. Most definitely. And then I've got one more just kind of a philosophical question going back to your magic system and how you rate things and whatnot. So we're going to summon our inner Disney here. 
No, we're not sponsored by Disney, though. If you want to write check, please do Disney. But Aladdin, how would you find this as a magic system? Because Jafar very obviously has a very rational, almost a hard system, because again, his spells are you know obviously done by a book with incantations and things like that. But yet the genie has this very kind of loose, flimsy magic, but there are still hard rules of what he can and can't do. So where would the magic of Aladdin fall on your scale? Okay, so two things about that. One, again, going back to perspective, when you're doing that, you can set the bounds of what you're examining. So if we wanted, we could use that to examine the genie separate from Jafar's powers. And depending on how fulfilled they are in the story, like I know in the movie they aren't that fulfilled, but let's say we did a long running game with that. As those two are explored more, they may end up being two entirely separate systems. But just looking at them real quick, I would say that they are probably soft, rational, almost irrational. Okay, yeah. And again, bringing that perspective is a great idea. And yeah, that didn't blip and it should have. And oh my God, yeah, just a great, yeah, great. Okay, so you've listened to our show for a little bit, so you know what's coming up next. One of the things we like to do with our guests is break out the dice and create a creature on the fly. I have recently taken the weird bug generator and modified it a little bit for my own ulterior motives in an attempt to get something that can more reliably create something that I can translate into Dungeons and Dragons stat blocks. Because the last couple of things that we've done have all been real tea tiny things that didn't really translate very well stat block wise. Gotcha. But that said... Do you have your dice, and are you ready to start rolling? I do. And side question, do you want me to roll on a silent surface, or you, or do you want the clatter? It doesn't matter. Okay. If it sounds good, I'll leave it in. If not, I can edit it out. Okie doke. Uh, <laughs> the power of post. All right. Yeah, so you. I have my dice. So let's get started with a d4 roll for its locomotion. Four. Four. It swims. All right. Okay. Next is a D6 for what does it eat? One. It eats inorganic material. Okay. Interesting. So I'm looking at like a bull shark right now with the the, uh, old license plate. Not the license plate, the... uh, Yeah, license plate and the tiger sharks. Yeah, the tiger sharks. Yeah, the bellies. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up is a D8 for size. Six. Six. It is huge. (laughs) Okay. Still going with the well theme here. Pretty close. Okay. I mean, so far what we've got is, oh, what is it? A delver that can swim. Oh, nice. And we didn't specify that it had to swim through a liquid. This is true. Oh, good point. Okay. Because the delver is able to, you know, basically dissolve its way through stone. So, so far we've got something kind of along those lines. Cause Ooh, it, something that swims through like magma or something like that. So can you read the phrasing for what it eats again? It eats inorganic material. Inorganic material. If we wanted, we could still go metaphysical with that. Yeah, we can define whatever inorganic material means. It could be something like ectoplasm. Yeah, or thoughts or feelings. Oh, yeah. It could be psychic energy. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it is. It is wide open. Cool. All right. So next up is a D10 roll for the number of limbs. One. One. So that means that it is sort of a crawling sort of pseudopod kind of amoeba-like thing. It's a okay. giant slug. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's a delver. Just It's lost its arms. Okay. <laughs> it's just, I really like delvers. They're, they're kind of cool. All right. What's next? Uh, next is another D10 roll for the number of eyes. Ten. Ten. All right. It has ten eyes. Interesting. Okay. I'm almost picturing like one of those sea slugs with yeah. the frills that okay. it kind of, it just ripples in order to swim through. Again, this could be stone. This could be magma. This could be water. This could be air. Yeah. Okay. I'm liking it. All right. Next up is a D12 roll for the method of defense. 12. 12. Pseudopod slash tentacle. I mean, that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. In this case, would those be just like the eye stalks? Now I'm actually kind of picturing like a sea cucumber version of a beholder, honestly. It's oh, it's my. a flail snail. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Just a really big. <laughs> this is what happens to flail snails on radiation. 
it could almost be like a sea anemone though too yeah it could maybe it has like some stingers or like a jellyfish yeah yeah oh like a jellyfish and since it eats in organic things we haven't pick that i'm thinking maybe something that phases between like the the aether uh and the astral realm to the physical realm yeah it and could, so it i mean could, even it still could... it could technically swim through the atmosphere right so i mean it could just sit there and kind of blub it could be like an ethereal marauder and able to phase between the material plane and the ethereal plane at will i think it would depend on like what cr we were looking to build here yeah, absolutely yeah. yeah all right next up is going to be a d20 roll for quirks Nine. Nine. Ink cloud sprays or leaks a cloud to obscure predator's vision. Perfect. I like it. I mean, this is all leaning heavy into an aquatic sort of creature. That would be the easiest way to build that it. That would be I the like easiest way to do it. stuff, though. Though, so, honestly, still, if you're going to the astral realm, because there is no gravity, no up and down, just a blob of ink just in the middle of whatever, because there's still no gravity, that still works. Oh, yeah. That would actually be interesting, because if you did it there, a giant blot of liquid would start drowning people. Yeah. Yeah. It would function almost like the darkness spell. Yeah. Except, yeah. except that it would actually drown you. <laughs> That would actually be a really nasty way to deal with high-level players, because just a cloud of water in a weightless environment, like, have fun dealing with that. <laughs> right? What I think would be really neat, too, is maybe this ink is used for writing spell books, magical spells. Okay. Oh, yeah. All kinds of weird, random magical or even hallucinatory effects that go with it. Oh, my God. Hallucinatory ink would be insane. Oh, my God. Hallucinating in the astral realm. Oh my god. <laughs> Worst acid trip ever. <laughs> well, it's Surprise, bank, so. it's real. It's not real. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> All right. Last thing is a D100 roll. Now we make it weird. Weirder. 79. 79 is... It's eggs slash excrement look like gold coins of the local denomination. <laughs> oh my okay which i think that's funny that's based awesome. on the fact that it eats inorganic material yeah yeah so it is like a living alchemist stone so you know why that's perfect is because gold is inert so it could be scooping up tons and tons of material and it's just dropping out it's inert minerals it in its digestion yeah and it's just dropping out the gold because it's like ah, i can't do anything with that that's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that'll also beg the question of, does it look like the local denomination or does the local denomination look like it? I think that one. Yeah, yes. I think so too. I think it would be one of those things where, you know, they originally came across it and they collected it. And then whenever they went to actually start minting currency, they mimicked what they found. <laughs> yeah. I'm just picturing golden rabbit droppings. <laughs> <laughs> So, Just little gold pellets. No, no, little <laughs> wombat cubes. Talking about it eating the inorganic materials, I love the concept of it basically just refining and dropping the gold. A secondary food source, we talked about psychic energy. What if it feeds off of avarice and greed? Ooh. Oh, man. Yeah. That, that could I mean, be fun. So if we wanted, like, this could actually be a really fun springing off point for building a, an entire biome or ecosystem, right? Because maybe they don't. But even if they don't, I think there definitely would have been psychic predators that developed that either feed off avarice or greed or learn to use the droppings as a trap. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, I can definitely see that, yeah. I mean, you definitely find these towards the back of like some old dungeons or like some old ruins or something like that. And they kind of just in the dark. And they're waiting for treasure hunters and they've got this here. So well, there's obviously treasure in here because people have come out with stuff. Right. Yeah, I like that a lot. That's a great idea. It's a lot like the Grick. The weird snake things with like the beak and the tentacles for face. Yeah. Because one of the things that they do, they're ambush predators, but they always drag their prey back to their nest and everything that isn't edible just goes into this one giant refuse pile. And so adventurers who know that there's a Grick there are going to go hunting for that pile because that's where all the shiny stuff is. Because the things that it's gotcha. not going to eat are like magic items and coins and gemstones, because it can't digest any of that stuff. One man trash. <laughs> so it'd be like an inverse of that, almost. Yeah, I like it. All right, James, do you want to roll the second D100, or do you want me to roll the second D100? I'll let you do it. My stuff's still all over the place, unfortunately. Okay. So let's see what we get. Uh, 
22. 22 is any severed slash discarded body parts can regenerate into a clone of the creature. That's perfect. Amazing. Amazing. I honestly now am... I like the jellyfish imagery. So what if it... Okay, so what about this? What if it looks like a snail on land, but it's actually swimming through the earth and there's just long tendrils that are flowing through the earth below it that you can't see, and that's how it's collecting the stuff that it feeds on. Okay, yeah, I yeah, can see that. Yeah, it makes kind of like a, what, the Portuguese man war where you only see yeah. them on the surface. It's a filter yeah. feeder. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like totally it. throw these at a party. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But the, the, then you can have weird stuff that's like pulling them into the ground and the tentacles are coming out of the ground in random places. Yeah, that would be that would be no fun. <laughs> and that would allow you to have something that looks like a medium sized creature. That's actually that's huge, actually yeah. a huge sized creature because most of it is underground. You know what? That would be really fun just as a player. If in the fight I cut off the tip of the tentacle and I kept it as a trophy and I found out that it was growing <laughs> into one and I kept it as a pet. <laughs> if they had sufficient intelligence to be tamed, to be domesticated. That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> or what you do is you take that piece and you just throw it into your bag of holding and you forget about it for like, you know, six or seven levels of campaign. <laughs> and then you have to like empty your bag of holding. This thing just pops out and it's angry. <laughs> and it's eating everything in there that's inorganic. <laughs> yep. All of your weapons, all of your coinage. You know. So all you're left with is a bunch of rotting meat and gold nuggets. <laughs> yes. And a yes. very angry whatever the hell we're naming this thing. <laughs> yeah. So what are we going to name it? Um. Okay. I really like the Manowar imagery. So what about something like the Terrawar? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how, like a Terra? T-E-R-R-A, like Terra Firma. Yeah. Is kind of what I'm thinking. But okay. You guys throw out your thoughts for sure. I feel like this is something that would definitely have a colloquial name to it as well. Something that like miners would call it. The party barge. <laughs> Earth strainers. I feel like there's something about filters that you could put in there. Stone feeders. Something like uh, gold pans, maybe? Like panning for gold? Maybe. I'm thinking like something like a skimmer, like a something skimmer. A dungeon skimmer, loot skimmer. Yeah. So it does kind of float on the top, you know? And it's obviously like collecting stuff from up underneath. What about ore skimmer? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Oh my god, imagine if, like you were saying, if you could domesticate one of these and throw these into a gold mine, like an ore mine. Yeah. That well, would be honestly, amazing. I was just thinking, imagine if you were a mining town and one of these things moved past overhead. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're just down in the tunnels when these tentacles just start sweeping through. Right. But I mean, if it's not eating organic things, depending on if it's hostile or not, you know, and that would be the innate thing. So, yeah. I mean, just because it doesn't eat people doesn't mean it won't kill people. Right. And so, I mean, like you have a giant cow. So, I, I mean, mean, it could be depending on how they treat it. Because, I mean, if you're wearing armor and one of these tendrils latches onto your armor, one you're going to be naked lies, regardless. Yeah. And it's going to suck you into the ground. Yeah, I can see oh, that. Oh, I actually kind of think that the gold is probably wrapped in actual turds because they are <laughs> they're gonna absorb organic matter and they're just gonna deposit it with the gold nuggets <laughs> i like it i like so, it so they're they're little gold geodes it's like the opposite <laughs> of the chocolate covered foil coins <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i love it all right so just a quick recap of what we've got with our ore skimmers so they swim they swim through the ground. They eat inorganic material. They are huge sized. They don't actually have any limbs, but they do have pseudopods. They have 10 eyes. They can emit an ink cloud. So we didn't resolve that, the sort of ink cloud. I mean, we talked about a little bit whenever we were going to have it. That can still be part of its organic output. Yeah. Or because my brain has been on this for a while, I mean, they could do it as like a uh, nanocarbon clouds that just kind yeah. of float there so that's what it's doing with all the organic material that it's consuming yeah or at least the carbon yeah at least the yeah. carbon from it okay it's excrement looks like coins in the local denomination <laughs> and it's severed or discarded body parts can regenerate into a clone of the original so yeah this is uh this is kind of terrifying and i love it i really do i like really one. want one as a pet and his name will be skimmy <laughs> but i can definitely see this as being one of those creatures that you come across that if you leave it alone and you stay out of its way it's not going to come after you right but if you happen to get in its way it's just going to run over you without even realizing that you're there Absolutely. and if you attack it that's even worse yeah 
because then you're going to be starting to chop off parts and it's going to start you're going to end up having 30 of them and this would be a case where the darkness spell actually makes sense because if it's a cloud of nanocarbon seeing in the dark won't help you because it's solid particulate <laughs> yes yeah I will say, if you're going to write this one up, Ian, I do want to add one caveat with it eating inorganic material. Okay. Either as an action or a legendary action, but if it attacks a player or a person with something and it tries to eat it, it actually eats a piece of, or a chunk of their armor and lowers their armor class. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, shoot, man. Now it's, uh, so it's sort of like a rust monster. Yes. Kinda, yeah. And, you know, magical items would have a saving throw to resist being eaten because they're magical. Yeah. And that's how magic items work in D&D. That does bring up a really quick question of does it like magic items? Like, does the magic give it an appealing flavor? Uh, I would say that it would probably try and avoid magic because, you know, magical items are not something that are found in nature. And I feel like it would, there are so many creatures that do seek out magical items like the Zorn. Okay. It'd be like the pepper plants capsaicin, unless you're a weird human creature. Most things don't like it. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, kind of like that. So I would actually say that, yeah, it would be okay with eating non-magical mundane items, but it would give it heartburn if it tried to eat magic items. Yeah, I mean, that makes reasonable sense. And that would make it a good mid-tier monster. Yeah. Because if you hold that to higher tier, all the equipment is going to be magical, meaning it's not going to do much. But low to mid-tier, you've still got stuff that's susceptible, but not so much stuff that it would completely debilitate the party. I would see this as being sort of a CR three to five somewhere in there yeah something with a lot of hit points but a low damage output and the cloning thing may not come in instantly that could be something like that's a random encounter right and then they're coming back the same way and now there's six of them Uh, (laughs) right (laughs) nice didn't we just hack this thing all to pieces (laughs) what was it was it the starfish i think it was in europe where they thought they were killing all the starfish because they were cutting them half and then throwing them back in the ocean and also they had a massive starfish population boom like what's going on they're eating all our stuff i think they were like eating the oysters or the clams or something like that but yeah they they thought they were eradicating the starfish and they were doing just the opposite (laughs) yeah life will find a way all right so the other thing that we like to do with our guests is to have our guests give a shout out to someone other than them that they feel deserves a little more attention. It could be a you know, YouTube creator, a TTRPG writer, streamer, an artist, anybody. Who would you like to shout out today, Clark? Well, because it's me, I'm going to push my luck and see if I can actually get a couple out there. Because it was really hard to narrow it down. Um, but these are people that I think will be very interesting to your audience. So one of them is the story engine by Peter Tchaikovsky. And he recently just did a Kickstarter for a new version of the story engine called the deck of worlds. And it is a, so the story engine is an infinite story prompt generator. The deck of worlds is that, but for world building, for developing settings and cultures and that kind of stuff. And I'm super excited for that to fully come out the other thing i'm gonna be completely honest i'm behind on your guys's episodes because i have been binging some lit rpg audiobooks because i got my audible credits back Woo-hoo. and <laughs> it can be really hit and miss with that subgenre which lit rpg by the way is fiction where game systems are a primary component in the story it often involves people who get pulled into vr or know that they are playing a game-like system and the two best authors I have found. So one series is Ascend Online by Luke Chimilenko, and the other one is Viridian Gate Online by James A. Hunter, and they are amazing. I've just been binging those. <laughs> awesome. I've got some Audible credits I need to burn, so yeah, I'm kind of like scanning everywhere for suggestions. And if you want something that's more sci-fi, check out The Game by Cosimo Yap, and I can give you guys links to all these. That'd be great. And then obviously you have your stuff and you do have quite a bit of stuff out there. I've mentioned a couple times your YouTube channel. So, I mean, you might want to throw that out. Ian mentioned you have a book on Amazon as well as your Indiegogo, correct? Yeah. The book on Amazon is a workbook specifically designed to help you build limitations for your magic systems. And it is called Restrictions May Apply, Building Limits for Your Magic. Very creative. And... I do have a YouTube channel. It is The Magic Engineer, where I talk all magic all the time. You can also find a ton of information on my website, which is crrowinson.com. 
And that's probably the best way to contact me is through the website, or you can find me on some of the Discord servers that I frequent. But right now, the big thing that I am focusing on and that is stressing me the hell out is the crowdfunding campaign over on Indiegogo for the Magic System Blueprint. And that is going to be running through September 4th. And I hadn't told Ian this yet, but I'm actually going to set up a secret backer tier for your listeners and for you guys. Ooh. Ooh. So that will just be through the link in this description and nowhere else. Cool awesome. deal. Thank you. I will make sure to actually include that <laughs> in the show notes. <laughs> None of this. Oops, I forgot to include it. That won't work this time. (laughs) If I do that, I'll have to actually pull it and repost it. But yeah, that's me. Those are the best places to find me. That's where you can find all the stuff I'm talking about. And yeah, please do swing by the Indiegogo campaign. Even if you don't end up backing it, share it, spread the word. That's how those things get traction. And I'm really all about trying to build these resources for writers. And that's really only going to work if writers know that it exists yeah very true all right so clark thank you very much for agreeing to come on and join us on undercommon yeah, taste of, today a ton of fun thank you so very much thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for listening today if you have any comments suggestions or ideas for future episodes please send us an email undercommon taste at gmail.com or send us a direct message through our twitter account at uct homebrew I'm still putting up our Shakespeare and Insult page day calendar inspired roleplay prompts six days a week. They go up on the Twitter account and get cross posted to the Instagram and Facebook accounts at Undercommon Taste. We're also on Patreon, patreon.com slash Undercommon Taste. So if you want to help support the show financially, please consider going over there and becoming a patron. You can find our podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. As always, please give us a rate and review. This helps increase our visibility and lets us know what you guys want to hear about. And thanks again for listening. And we will see you next week in Arborea as we dive back into our planar escapades. Happy gaming. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Undercommon Taste. If you enjoyed what you heard, please pass it along to your friends. If you have comments, suggestions, or ideas, you can email them to us at undercommontaste at gmail.com. If we like your idea, it may make it into a future episode. You can find us wherever you find your podcasts, and we would greatly appreciate any likes, ratings, and comments you could provide. Find us on social media. We're at Undercommon Taste on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and on Twitter at the handle at UCT Homebrew. If you would like to help support the show financially, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash undercommontaste. Our theme is Massacre Anne, written and performed by Mary Crowell and used with permission. You can find her online at marycrowell.bandcamp.com or on Patreon at patreon.com slash drmarycrowell. Thanks again for listening, and stay safe. You'll hear from us again soon.